everybody welcome back to pagan's witchy corner my name is pagan and today i am joined by a guest who was on the show just a few weeks ago and y'all seem to love her and that is anwin avalon Aval anwin is back to talk about some really cool happenings that you all should definitely be aware of and these are some really fun virtual online conferences that we're going to talk all about and then we're going to talk about some fun wa water magic stuff so anwin welcome back to the show Thank you so much for having me. I'm glad to be here. So you have a really great show that is coming up here in just a little over almost two weeks now. And uh, that is the Water Pri Priestess Confluence. And that is going to be April the 5th through the 7th of 2024. Tickets are on sale for that right now. And you have some amazing people that are going to be there. And you also have so much great stuff that's happening with that. So First of all, how did this confluence kind of come into being? Because it's the second one, and obviously, you know, you guys are probably going to continue this in the future. So how did it just kind of uh, come into being? Oh, my gosh. Um. Okay, that's actually a really good question. And I'm sitting here thinking, and I don't know. <laughs> it just came oh, in. It, it spawned out of thin air, which sometimes often does happen in the magical world. Just stuff happens, and you're like, oh, we're doing this thing. I don't know how we just started to do this thing, but we're doing it. So that's okay. okay. That's the answer. <laughs> I had to, okay. I thought for a second and I had to think for a second. So I think I remember I was in the Azores, um, which is a like tropical, like volcanic island off the coast of Portugal. Um, that is got a lot of, weird connections to possibly like one of the locations for Atlantis um it has a whole bunch of like weird pyramidal mound structures and the Romans were there it has a lot going on plus volcano volcanoes and just it got a lot going on but I was on I went on a retreat mm -hmm. and um on this retreat it was one with a bunch of other women that were you know like sacred women priestessy type of women and you know, when I first started my water priestess journey, there was no such thing as a water priestess. Um, I started, oh my gosh, I'm, okay, this is going to be a long answer. That's it okay. Just you can go as long as you is. need to because it's always fascinating. <laughs> <laughs> so, <clears throat> I just realized as I started talking, I was like, oh, here I go. Okay, side questing. But it's important. Um, so... When I first began kind of this journey of water and water magic and everything like that, there was like literally nothing out there. I guess maybe that's a little bit wrong. There was very little out there. We had The Sea Priestess written by Dion Fortune, which was an, an esoteric novel. Sandra Keynes had come out with her sea magic, like just shortly after my initiation. Um, and there was like a book or two on like magical mermaids and things like that. And um, I was in, at this point, I was in, I was here in Glastonbury and I got this message during meditation that I needed to start teaching about water magic. And I resisted it at first, but eventually we got there and I did start teaching about water magic. And then that turned into water witchcraft, which then turned into my first book, Water Witchcraft, Magic and Lore from the Celtic Tradition. And the big thing about that book is that Water Witchcraft and the Way of the Water Priestess were originally one big book. And they kind of got cut in half because I submitted way too many words. I'm getting, I'm, I'm circling back to how the confluence came about. I promise I'm getting there. You're okay. Um, <laughs> so, so, um, so it ended up, the, the books got split into two. And so the way of the water priestess came out several years later, um, cause in the publishing world, it can take forever to mm -hmm. do things. Um, so that came out a couple of years later and, um, a little while after that, I went on this pilgrimage to the Azores and there was a lot of priestessy women and like a lot of watery women and the lady that runs it also identifies as a water priestess but interestingly enough like came through a very different um road and um so we kind of found each other through a mutual friend who is also a sacred water woman um isabel friend and she's this fantastic water researcher um but we kind of found each other through her 
And I was like, I'm just going to go on this retreat because I just, I really needed a freaking vacation after COVID. And I, I just wanted to, to go and soak in hot springs and all this, that, and the other. Anyways, on that trip, I was talking to the women, the, the women that were on the trip and the woman running it. And we were just like, it's so crazy that like 10 years ago, when we first started this whole thing, like our whole path of water, like there was nobody out there that was a water priestess. Like I personally used to have arguments with people on the internet because I would say things like, oh, I'm a water witch or, oh, I'm a water priestess. And they'd be like, there's no such thing. Those things don't exist. Like, just call yourself a sea priestess like everyone else. And I was like, no, because while I love the ocean, like springs and fresh water bodies of water are my, like, what really calls to me. And that is not salty water. So I'm not a sea priestess. I'm a water priestess. Mm -hmm. So anyways, we had this conversation about like how crazy it was that like that just this path didn't exist. And then here we are on this retreat and we're colliding and like we're just having this great time. And it's like really amazing to see kind of our craft um, really begin to develop and to raise awareness. And, you know, anyways, long story short, I said, well, maybe I think we have enough people now that we could do a conference. Like, there's enough of us that, like, we could actually, like, come together. Like, there's enough watery women. We could come together and we could, like, do a conference. Mm -hmm. And I think that's when the first little seed was planted. And then um, it took me almost a whole year and a half to actualize it. I picked a date. I put it on the calendar. And then I moved to the UK um, <laughs> during kind of like that launch so the very first one that we did was here in Glastonbury although it was on zoom um and so then the second one which is coming up this year um is also going to be held on zoom and I'll be broadcasting from uh, Glastonbury and my co-host Laura Lai will be broadcasting from the states um and we've got so many good um watery workshops planned we're super excited about it but anyways really long story short that is how the idea came was just this moment of like oh my gosh like what we've been fighting for for so long actually like is here mm -hmm. and like let's do something about it and then I definitely knew that it was gonna be something that we did every single year because our water is just so precious and there's so many amazing women out there and there's so many different modalities and so many different like ways to approach water priestessing um that like there's quite a bit I mean we have everything from like comedic water magic to um you know just working with dolphins and light codes to um I think we have a a like workshop with the Morrigan, the Irish goddess, the Morrigan, um, to water science. I mean, it, it's really like a, a broad, very broad field because mm -hmm. basic qualifications are water and celebrating like the, fe celebrating the feminine voice of water. And that is, is very big. That's very big. So there's a lot that gets covered and a lot of people approach water priestessing and the arts of watery magic uh, in many different ways. Like um, we have <laughs> one of my favorite workshop descriptions this year is it's something along the lines of working with mermaids, not the Disney kind. <laughs> and, <laughs> and I was like, um, I love this workshop so much. <laughs> I love uh, it so much. That's so great. <laughs> so, so it's really, it is really a big watery ocean. Um, but yeah, anyways, that's a really long way to get to the end of that answer. But uh, yeah, that's how it came about. Hey, you know, sometimes we have to take the long roads to get to where we're going and that's okay. It gives you, <laughs> it gave so much background into how it came into being. And honestly, you know, learning about how, kind of the title of Water Priestess really kind of came into being as well, which it's true. Until recently, I would say a Water Priestess was not somebody that you would really hear of unless it was in terms of sea magic. So, you know, kind of 
realizing that yes there are other bodies of water out there that you can work with outside of the ocean don't get me wrong water uh priestessing with the ocean is still great and wonderful and always accepted but you know what about working with the lakes and what rivers and streams and ponds and those weird murky you know swampy kind of pools that you know are down deep in the south and all that so when you start working with all those different places it's not the same water and understanding that makes it so much better because then you can tap into so many different energies even though it still is technically the same element right you know there's like this saying that drives me nuts and it's it goes all water is like what like yeah all water is one water or something like that and it drives me nuts because i'm like no it's not <laughs> Even in it, science, it's, it's water... not the same because the water is all technically different. It may still be the same right. basic element, but it has different things in it that make it different. Exactly. If all water was one water, go drink the ocean. Um... <laughs> For, uh, you know, all of the safety reasons, please don't go drink the ocean. That's not a good oh. and wise decision, <laughs> just for the record. Right. And I... <laughs> Thanks for that disclaimer, because the way that I just said it was, like, super authoritative, like, <laughs> and, you know, I, I'm not trying to get you canceled or me banished to some corner of the internet for, for the drinking of ocean water. Um, that is not what I, <laughs> that is not what I mean. Please do not do that. Do not harm yourself. <laughs> yes, do not harm yourself by doing that. Obviously, take care of yourself and do all those good things. But yes, experiencing the different types of waters. And it's funny how different places and different bodies of water also have different vibes to them, which is so cool and all that. And I'm kind of getting off a tangent off the confluence. But at the same time, I'm like, yes, let's talk about it. And it's so great. <laughs> um, I think it fits, though, with talk about the confluence, though, because, like, you might, like, Okay, so someone may have read my first book and then get really excited about the confluence. Um, my first book, for those that don't know, is Water Witchcraft, right? Mm -hmm. And then they might go and get excited and go look at the water confluence and be like, okay, what are light codes and, and like, you know, sound healing with the dolphins? That doesn't seem anything like what Erin wrote about in her first book, and it's not. Um, but I think that what you were saying about you know, there, there's so many different types of water and so many different ways to experience it. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that that fits with what the confluence is all about is like, I might have my favorite body of water, but then there's like other bodies of water as well. And they also have their own ecosystems and their own like mysteries. And there's so much excitement and things to learn. Um, and they're all so different. Um, and so that's really what the confluence is about so it it really what what you're saying really fits with it because yeah it's like every every pre presenter is a different body of water and brings something different you know a little swampy energy um with our voodoo priestesses you know like some of that kind of uh energy with alongside our you know light workers um and it's it's really a place where we all come together and that water is the focus um, and that we can learn and deepen our practices so much. Um, so I love what you were talking about with different bodies of water. And, it, you know, it's also for those who are listening out there, um, there's you you offer two different types of conferences. You offer the confluence, which is coming up. Uh, here in a couple of weeks, but you also have one that was uh, last year as well, and you're going to be doing it again this year, and that is Bewitching the Waters, which is a little on the, what we could say is the dark water version in comparison to the Confluence, correct? Yes. The Confluence has definitely got, like, this energy of, like, Florida... The confluence is like the energy of Florida. <laughs> and the reason that I say that is because it is bright. It is beautiful. It has got sparkling crystal waters and beautiful sandy beaches. And then it also has like a sprinkling of, you know, some swampy energy and, you know, maybe a shark or two among all of those dolphin light codes. And then you've got bewitching the waters and that is like 
immersing yourself in the depths of the swamp yes. or traversing the Mariana Trench and hanging out with like underwater, like those like really deep underwater fish, uh, like the angler mm-hmm. fish and like the those like uh glow in the dark octopus those like white ghostly octopus um you know like it definitely is more nocturnal there is um a strong element of folk magic um because that is one of my deep loves um but then also sorcery because that is one of Lorelai's deep loves Mm -hmm. um and again so with the water priestess confluence Lorelai is my co-host and partner in crime um and she's also my co-host and partner in crime over at Bewitching Waters as well um and we are very similar in the fact that we have one foot in those beautiful crystalline waters and then like one foot in the depths of the darkness um you have that balance you know <laughs> it, it is, you know it's all about balance and i know that there's many interpretations of the high priestess card from the tarot but if you look at the imagery on that card you have a white pillar and you have a black pillar mm-hmm. and for me it's always been very much about the fact that I have one foot in the world of light and one foot in the world of darkness. Um, And it is a path where I am the middle. It is, it's, it's a path of duality and of balance. Um, And I think that water in itself really embodies that um, because you do have this like beautiful, um, you know, nourishing type of energy that water brings. Um, and then you've got bright, beautiful things like beautiful, you know, orange starfish and, um, you know, just tropical fish and like just so many like amazing, beautiful things that the water holds within it. But then you also have things like sharks and man of war and sea urchins that if you get pricked the, like by the wrong one mm-hmm. can, you know, kill you and sea snakes and sharks and i probably said sharks eight times it's okay to like sharks i mean i i like sharks too i don't know if i would want to meet one but i do like them i think they're fascinating so yeah i totally need a shark i'm like i would love to just uh, and and when I say shark, I know everybody's thinking of like great whites, but there's a lot of other really cool sharks out there's, there. There's sharks, that, uh, you know. Yes. Uh, I've, of course, hammerheads because those are always interesting. And there's tiger sharks and mango sharks and, and shark. so many, so many little sharks yes. that you could just you know meet. Obviously, not all of them are friends, even though they might be friend shaped. They're not always friends. Don't don't go randomly like pet sharks. <laughs> Unless you're, like, in a place where you know they're not going to, like, bite you, that would be okay. But, again, use caution and safety, please. <laughs> like, don't drink the ocean. That's also a thing that's caution and safety. Don't do that. But, <laughs> um, ocean is dangerous. The ocean is like dangerous and a little episode. terrifying. But at the same time, it's like, ooh, pretty. <laughs> so, uh. But yes, Bewitching the Waters definitely um, is a more bewitching experience. Um, And uh, we take, yes, a turn into the nocturnal realms of water and explore the occult and esoteric things and folk magic and folklore and sorcery and spirits. Um, Like um, I taught about shape-shifting sirens um, at the last one. and I don't know what I'm teaching about at the 2024 Bewitching the Water Symposium, but it'll be awesome. It's going to be <laughs> awesome. I I have looked over some of the amazing people that you had last year, which um were just awesome. Obviously, your keynote speaker is Judica Isles. If you are a longtime listener of the show, you know Judica has been on the show. We love her so very much. Uh, There was also Mara Starling and... Sarah Lawless and so many other amazing names, Madame Pamita and just, oh my gosh, like you have such 
amazing individuals obviously when wendy matta who will also be on the show uh coming up here in the next several weeks um which i'm excited to talk to her about i like oh can't you're even gonna wait. love her so <laughs> uh, just so <laughs> much cool stuff and i'm reading over this the like headlines of this and i'm like man i can't believe i missed this i bet it was awesome <laughs> such a good it was such a good event oh my gosh i can't even believe that we had sarah lawless on there like that was wild um She's, uh, I mean, just so knowledgeable. Um, Nicholas Pearson is another one that um, I'm just going to try saying his name everywhere that I possibly can because um, people are just not like hype enough about Nicholas Pearson. And I think that we should change that because he is, if, if you like crystals at all, mm -hmm. or if you are like interested in any type of crystal, magic um he's the go-to he is incredibly knowledgeable his books are amazing um he's just he's so lovely I've been collaborating with him um for a little bit now and he, every time he just blows my mind and oh my gosh I we haven't released this okay this is super secret squirrel news that I'm I'm about to just like you're, you're gonna drop, drop the bomb oh, drop the, the bomb do it <laughs> So speaking of Nicholas Pearson, um, he is going to be one of the speakers um, alongside Ashley um, of Love and Light School, mm -hmm. um, who is also a crystal guru, and Brett, um, which is the Witch of Salopia, and um, Moss Mathy, um, and myself um, on June 1st. We are going to be having a one day mini um, symposium on fossil magic. <gasps> like, oh, that's going to be amazing. Right? Like the uses of fossils in magic. And Nicholas Pearson is going to be teaching a little bit about the science behind like how like fossils are formed and all of that kind of stuff which there's no one better to talk about those things than him he's he's got all of the knowledge but also he's doing a workshop on amber and jet which i am obsessed with and are connected to water because that you actually find amber and jet like on the seashore mm -hmm. um and then um i'll be doing a little bit about ammonites in connection with sacred wells um and I don't want to give everything away because it will be on the website um, hopefully in the next week. Um, it'll be on waterwitchcraft.com, so be looking there. Um, but we have a whole day planned out of just fossils, of fossils, fossils. I mean, Bellamites in magic, um, German, uh, Moss, Moss Matthew does a lot with like German folklore. So there'll be a little bit on that. Um, yeah it's it's going to be awesome like i'm so ex i'm so excited about it because like first off fossils are used in folk magic in like so many ways like we don't even like think about like how much we actually use like a little bellamite or a little orthocera or a little ammonite or amber uh mm -hmm. or jet like all of these things like we we all use them or maybe we have like a little necklace that someone gave us with a piece of amber on it um but anyways, um, they're watery. They're like ancient ancestral water spirits that are like frozen in stone. Um, and there's so much that, that can be done with them. They can be used like crystals because a lot of them do agatize or like turn into crystal like forms. Mm -hmm. So there's like crystals. Then you've got like the metamorphosis of changing from animal to stone. Um and then you've got the, the stone properties, but then you've also got the animal properties. Um, oh, yeah. I'm so excited. That As sounds so amazing. And I am uh, obviously you're going to have to the, all of the links to all of these conferences and uh, everything is all going to be in the show description. I will post everything so that way people can attend. You can get your tickets. You can go and check out all these amazing people. And obviously some of them will be featured on the show because we're in contact with lots of them. So <laughs> make sure you are a longtime listener. So that way you can always check out who we have on the show. 
Um, and of course, Anwen's always going to come back for it because we will have so much great stuff to talk about. But I am so excited for everything that you guys are doing. And I love that there is such a diversity in the different aspects of water magic that you are bringing out to the world through obviously yourself and so many other different voices and allowing people to see that it's not just this teeny tiny itty bitty little part of paganism but it actually is a full and and developing and massive practice that needs to be explored in much more depth which you're doing such a wonderful job of well thank you <laughs> so um obviously now we have talked about the conferences which i'm so excited for and now the other thing i kind of we mentioned a little bit last time you were on the show but i don't think we really got to dive deep into it was um the sacred pools and how they are super connected into those liminal spaces and kind of how you know we I think we touched a little bit about how they bring um, different types of beings into connection with each other into different places. Now, I guess my question for you is, what are your thoughts on these liminal pools and how we have different types of folklore that matches up with different parts of the world, especially in terms of like Fae and stuff like that? Do you think those liminal pools are kind of doorways that all bridge together in a way? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. <laughs> uh, <laughs> okay. So, um, this is a lot of what um, my first book, the um, Water Witchcraft, was about. Because um, in it, you'll see a lot of bodies of water, talking about very specific bodies of water or general bodies of water. But you'll also see a large portion of spirits. This mm -hmm. particular Kelpie, the story about this particular Kelpie or this story about these particular, um, you know, water horses from the Scottish Highlands or um, the Gwagatha Noon, which are the Welsh lake ladies, which translate as wives of the underworld. Um, there's actual stories about them that indicate that the lakes that they live in are portals to other realms. I'll circle back to those. Um, but I want to touch on two on, on a couple other bodies of water. So mm -hmm. um, when we look at the sea, when we look at the ocean, there was a belief, especially within Celtic practices. Um, and I believe that this may leak into some of the Norse practices as well, because there is a connection with um, the nine uh, wave maidens, which um, there does seem to be some sort of connection with the idea of the mill maidens, the nine maidens, the um, nine daughters of Ran, mm -hmm. which are the wave maidens. And the idea that the ninth wave um, or to go beyond the ninth wave is to go into the other world. Um, like the ninth wave itself is a liminal access point. Um, and so there's multiple different ways like that you can use that, whether it's like in a vision journey or actually in the physical world. Um, but to swim past nine waves um, is like to enter into another realm or to enter into the watery realms. Then we have stories of fountains, springs, and wells. Now, in old, older stories in folklore, you may see a you know text from the 1300s speak about a fountain, but and then you might see a text in the 1800s that speaks about a well. And these are basically describing the same thing. When we think about a fountain in a modern day context, we think of the thing that's at the shopping mall that was built in order to pump water through it with electricity, of course, artificially pumping water through to like cascade down and make this beautiful water feature. This is like a modern idea of a fount. But when we look at these older texts, when they say founts, what they mean are springs right. or wells, where the water is free flowing from the earth 
um, and is most likely drinkable. So um, in the story, okay, so here's where we start circling back. So um, in the story of the Well Maidens, mm -hmm. there's actually a poem called The Elucidation. Um, I believe it's about the 1300s. And in it, it, uh, it, it tells the story of um, the Well Maidens. And the Well Maidens were described as they were the voices of the wells so this gives two indications one um it's possible that they were oracles very much like the oracle of delphi um or the pythia was like the voice of the oracle of delphi right she spoke uh she was the conduit and spoke on behalf of the gods um so it's possible that that's what this indicates is that they were oracles or and that they spoke on behalf of the wells However, I think that it's more likely that the well maidens are fairy women um, that are aquatic fairy women. Um, and that when they say that they were the voices of the wells, they're literally saying that they are the like physical embodiment and the personification of the sacred springs. Um, and so I do think that we have these stories, especially from like Greek mythology that talks about shape shifting, especially in the realms of nymphs, they could go from human form into a tree. Um, and so we see a lot of that also paralleling some of the stories around the fair fairy realm. Mm -hmm. So when the, when King Ag, uh, Ag, Mem Ag it's not Agamemnon because that's a different king from a very different time period. Um, but it's it's really close. It's King Amegnon, something like this. Okay. Came. And he, he he basically passed by the wells where the well maidens were. And the well maidens' jobs, they're they basically what they did is they stood near the wells and they had golden bowls and they would fill the golden bowls with water and give it freely to those that pass by. They would also feed them um, with like a never ending like platters of fruit and just, just abundance. Well, when the king came, he saw the beautiful well maidens and he saw their golden bowls and all of their beautiful abundance. And he decided to take for himself and assaulted the well maiden, stole her golden bowl um, and forced her to serve him. And when the other well maidens saw this, they retreated back into the wells and the wells dried up and became silent. Mm -hmm. And that is the important key part right there. They retreated back into the wells and the wells dried up and became silent. So how does a human go into a well? They don't. That indicates that the well maiden were something that appear in human form, but are much, much more than human. They have other abilities. And if they are able to retreat back into the wells, that means, and it indicates that the wells themselves are portals into a sub-aquatic realm or into another realm. Yes. Now, when we swing back and we look at the stories of the lake, um, and the lake ladies, and not King Arthur, not the Arthurian lake ladies. Um, I do believe the Arthurian lake ladies are in the same subclass of um, watery women. Um, they are probably a Gwagatha Noon, which is a Wives of the Underworld is what it, it translates as. Mm -hmm. And there's multiple stories about them. The very first one that we see is um, found in the original text of the Mabinogi, and it's about a shepherd. Um, a very short version of this story is uh, very similar to Goldilocks and the Three Bears, where the young man comes to the edge of the lake, and there's a beautiful lake maiden that rises out of the lake, wants to have some of his bread, but it's too hard. So she says, come back tomorrow with softer bread. So he does, and it's still, and then it's too soft. And then she says, come back a third time with bread that's not too soft, not too hard. And he does. And then basically they get married, they have children. But when they get married with her out of the lake, arises a pretty serious dowry of cows like a lot of cows and they come out of this lake and I've been to this lake. This is not like the great lakes mm -hmm. in the U S like, this is like a lake that I could walk around in like 90 minutes. Oh, okay. Okay. So it's not a huge, 
it's not like this huge, huge lake. It's it's quite small. So where are all of these cows coming from? Um, and then at the very end of the story, her husband, you know, betrays her. He breaks the bargain and she decides that she's had it with him. And she goes back into the lake. And with her, all of the cows go back into the lake. And then she comes out of the lake several times to visit her sons and teach them the gifts of herbal knowledge. There's other stories of other lake ladies with these magical cows that they bring these magical cows out of the lakes and they give them to the village, they give them to farmers and such. And then, of course, they're abused and the lake ladies get mad and they call their cows back home and the cows go to the lake and they descend into the water. There's another story of the same group of beings mm -hmm. where it's a later folk story and um, it's on Lunasa. So August 1st or Lamas or um, Kalan Oust. Um, I guess if you're Welsh, it's Kalan Oust. And then like Neo-Pagan is uh, Lunasa. And then um, I guess like more Catholic is Lamas, I think. But anyways, um, August 1st. Lamas was Catholic. That's interesting. Okay. It's Learning well, something well, new now. <laughs> Well, don't quote me on that. I I might be wrong. Okay. I'm not 100% sure where Lamaze comes from. Um, so, you know, I'm I'm not sure. Let let's just put like a big question mark by that. Okay. Um, <laughs> I don't want that to end up on the internet like <laughs> Anwin's it's Catholic. No, Anwin's just probably tired uh, and doesn't know. <laughs> That's completely um, fair too. Sometimes that happens. Sometimes we we don't always know the origin stories. So if you're a listener and you do know the origin story of that, send me an email so that way we can make sure that we all have the same correct information. Right. Yes, please do. Now, I know where Callan Oust comes from, right? Like that's yes. Welsh. Um, <laughs> that I do know. Uh, Thank you, Mara Starling, for teaching us. Right. I know. Actually, um, I, I didn't learn that from Mara Starling. Um, you know, it, it actually came from my work with um, the Sisterhood of Avalon. Oh, interesting. But anyway, okay. Anyway, sorry, we digress. <laughs> okay, so um, so this story is really important. So in this story of another lake lady, um, there's a, a young man out on, you know, August 1st, out and about, and he comes to a lake, and this lake is kind of nestled in a cliff face or next to a cliff, and it's a beautiful woman, and a door opens in the side of the cliff, and she brings him into the cliff and down underneath the lake where he gets a tour of her subaquatic town that's literally underneath this lake. Um, she tells him not to take anything, not even to pick a flower. No, you know, no food. The, you know, fairy rules apply. No food, no flowers, no taking anything from the fairy mm -hmm. realm. Unfortunately, he does. He takes a single flower and the door is closed. And this is why we can't go back. Um, there's one other story about lake ladies. This one comes from um, Brittany. It's also a later telling. So in this one, the lake lady has been uh, demonized and is uh, evil. She is... Um, they call her a lake fairy or a witch, a witch. Of, it's called the Witch of Lock Island. And this is a really long folk story. But the important part is, is this young man goes off to find his fortune. And he comes to the side of this lake where this witch of Lock Island supposedly lives. And um, he's supposed to, like, figure out how to get to the island. So there is a swan that is near the bank of the lake, like the, the, the edge of the lake. Mm -hmm. And so he goes over to the swan and he puts his foot on the back of the swan and the swan then acts as a vehicle um, or as a boat or a, a vessel of transportation. And the swan then dives underneath the water and takes this young, young man to the realm of the witch of Lock Island or to the island of the, the witch. Um, but the way that it's written, it's obvious that they submerge underneath the water mm -hmm. and that they come up in some other realm. 
where there's magic. Um, she has a castle that's made out of pearls and shells, um, but she likes to catch human men and turn them into fish and fry them in her frying pan. <laughs> um, <yeah. laughs> I actually really love this story, um, but it's, it's very clearly a later telling of some sort of um, fairy tale or about a fairy woman, a, a lake lady, that um, because as time goes on, they lose their, um, a lot of the goddesses and fairy women, they, they lose their divinity and they become demonized. So this, this is clearly like the description of her. He ends up catching her in like an iron net and it's just like, oh, that, that's a fairy woman. Like it just is. Um, so anyways, the reason that I bring all of these stories up, um, oh, one last one, one last one. And then <laughs> Have made my they're point. all they are all such amazing stories. I'm just like, yes, teach me, tell me more. <laughs> so, um, in both my first book, Water Witchcraft, and my newest book, Celtic Goddess Grimoire, um, there's the story of Melusine. Yes. And in the Melusine story, two things happen that are really important. One of them is well, three things happen actually. The first one is that she is cursed, Melusine is cursed, and ends up having her mermaid tail or tails on a Saturday that's her first watery connection but more importantly when we get to the point of the story where her husband Raymondine is introduced he's he has just accidentally killed his uncle and he is riding through the forest on his horse like really distraught he threw the spear um him and his uncle were um hunting a boar and he threw a spear and it missed the boar and it hit his uncle. And his uncle was like this duke and like, is this a big deal that he's dead? So he's riding through the forest. He's just in that like, like pure panic, like just distraught and just wandering. But it gets really late. So it's about midnight. So midnight in the middle of a forest in France, Raymond Dean is wandering very distraught on his horse. When out of nowhere... Three beautiful women appear at a fount. And at first I was like, oh, cool. Three beautiful women appearing at a fount. And then I was like, oh, wait. That, they just appeared at a fount. That fount, that spring, mm -hmm. that is, that, that, this is like a subway station. Is the fount like a subway station? And is the subaquatic realms like the subway? Like, it, are they able to like, move from place to place these fairy women these beings um so at the very least like yes i think absolutely that there that these um lakes that these founts um these watery bodies um yeah th these watery bodies of or th these bodies of water these um <laughs> i think i'm getting tired i'm like these watery bodies these bodies <laughs> Bodies of water. Um, yes, we follow. <laughs> these bodies of water. Um, there are so many stories. I mean, I've just rattled off a handful that I know that come from England and France. And that is a tiny portion of the world. There's stories all over the place, um, even with Nessie in Scotland. Um, Nessie being this like sea monster, the sea creature that somehow is there and then somehow disappears constantly. Um, and like there'll be a sighting and then they'll go looking and they can't find anything and then there'll be another sighting. But this is not the only one. Ogopogo, which um, comes from the um, First Nations people in BC. So mm -hmm. like Northwest British Columbia area. Um, they also have a watery creature that's a lot like Nessie that is in one of the lakes. And it also has this habit of being there and having sightings and then poof, gone, can't find it. Um, and so I absolutely 100% like I'm convinced and deeply believe that these bodies of water are absolutely portals, not only from the 
realm of spirit into the human world, but into dimensions like subaquatic realms. There's like the aquatic realm, right? Mm -hmm. So we have like the physical world where we breathe air. And then we have like the aquatic realm, which would be like a river in the ocean. Like these are all like aquatic realms in the physical world. But then then there's subaquatic realms, which are then the realms that are underneath the earth. Um, but then subaquatic, I think, has a double meaning because the subaquatic realms are things like that lake that's deep, deep, deep in the cave. Um, you know, like caves have bodies of water in them. Mm-hmm. I've been to several caves that have lakes or I've been to an underground river. This is a subaquatic realm. This is a realm that's aquatic, that's underneath the earth. But then I also think that subaquatic has another meaning. And it's the same realm that that lake lady brought that young man in to the side of the cliff and down into the realms underneath her lake um, to show him her village. Mm -hmm. Or the realms from which Melusine was able to simply appear in the middle of the forest at midnight or what is beyond that ninth wave or what is um you know what is the realm of the witch of lock island was did he go to a lake or did he go to an island underneath a lake that doesn't seem very plausible but did he go to a different dimension maybe yes, I, probably <laughs> <laughs> and so like the fairy realm is another dimension so I, I do think that there's a lot to unpack with water as portals honestly there really is and like everything that you're kind of talking about especially what ring true with the you know subaquatic it, it also kind of brings about the the imagery of kind of a space in between as well that that kind of liminal <laughs> space of water um that's not really in the earthly realm but also not really below either and it's somewhere in between and so you get those kind of imagery as well and so you also get the uh when you were talking about the cryptids thing too you realize at the same time when you're kind of hearing this that cryptids have also this very physical kind of we're supposed to think that they're physical beings but they also have so many esoteric and so much mes- mystical and magical things about them. If you think about the lore behind like Bigfoot and you think about the lore behind Nessie and so many others. Like I could go down a whole cryptid rabbit hole, but we're not going to. But they have so many different things. And it's so interesting how these different types of portals and kind of come into being. And what kind of brought the whole, you know, thing about what you were saying with the um the lake ladies that kind of appeared in the forest in the middle of the night well we also have a lot of cryptids that appear out of nowhere in the middle of forests and well plants can't grow without a water source mm-hmm. so if so many like springs are just everywhere yeah like people realize that there's just springs even in arizona there are springs yes in the desert like there are just like poof, there's a spring, just water flowing right out of the earth. Um, they're everywhere. And so as like as you were saying that, I was like, oh man, that's how they're doing it. That's, that's how, how that's like, how they're getting all over the place. You know, that's how we have like Bigfoot in one place, and then it's like, but I'm pretty sure this is the same Bigfoot that's like a hundred miles that direction. And it's like, how did they get there within like, you know, a couple of hours or similar time periods? Is it two different Bigfoots? It, like Honestly, I could go down a whole cryptid rabbit hole. I think it's fascinating. But that (laughs) we don't have time for that today, unfortunately. And it's so interesting and fascinating. And the the science behind everything. And it is science when you start really kind of breaking it down and looking at it. Because we don't really know 100% of how it all works. But we do know that there is, it is connected. And we can see that there are lots of different beings that will traverse and do different places through ways of water and it's like well how did they get there there's got to be some kind of water that's always connected to somebody else somewhere else whether it's going down through the earth or whether it's connected to a bigger body of water it's still connected and then there's the whole 
aspect two, which we also really don't have the time to get into and I would love to, which is the connection of water to the dead and oh. how the dead are able to move <laughs> through watery places and be connected to bodies of water and how you can perform canings through bodies of water. Like, it's a whole thing. I mean, we could really just go down a whole rabbit hole just of the dead and water by itself, which you may have to come back to do because that would be a fascinating topic. <laughs> Maybe that would be something really good for witchy season. Yes, we could totally do that. But that since we are almost out of time, uh, obviously, you know, you were on the show before, but for those who may not have listened to the previous episode, where can everybody find you and uh, social media? And like I said, all the uh, stuff that we've talked about, all book links, conference links, everything's going to be in the show description. But just in case you're somebody that's like TLDR, didn't read, I just want to hear it and then write it down. You can do that too. So where can everybody find you? All right. Best places to find me on social media is going to be Instagram. I post there pretty regularly. That's my main platform. Um, and you can find me under my first and last name, Anlin Avalon. Um, you can also find pages for Bewitching the Waters, um, and uh, which is Bewitching the Waters. Um, and then the Water Priestess Confluence, which is Water Priestess Arts on Instagram. You can also find me and other, like if you don't do Instagram, you can find me on TikTok, um, Facebook, and threads and YouTube under Anwen Avalon. If you just search my name on any of those platforms, you'll find me. Um, and then my websites um, are waterpriestess.com for water priestess training, water priestess interviews, and the water priestess confluence. Um, but if you want to take a turn into more of the darker arts, then you can find me over at waterwitchcraft.com, which is where I have um, the Witching the Water Symposium, which will be up in a couple of months. This is where the Fossil Symposium will also be hosted. You can also find my um, Folklore of the Sea classes, my Water Magic 101, my Water Magic um, Master Course, um, and what else is on that website? I think oh, Oracle Readings and such with me. Um, and then I do have another website, AnlinAvalon.com, which details my entire professional and creative portfolio. Um, so anyways, that's a lot of places to find me, but you'll find me in <laughs> one of those places. So... <laughs> Like I said, all links will be in the show description. Everything will be convenient right there to click of a button for you. So it'll be easy to find. Um, and when, this has been wonderful. And I'm so excited for all of the conferences that you're going to be hosting in the next year. And I cannot wait to hear about them. Obviously, if you're a longtime listener of the show or if you're a new listener to the show and you're going to be a longtime listener, you will hear a lot of the guests that will be at those conferences coming by the show as well to talk about some of their experiences, their books, and all of their cool stuff. So make sure you are listening to the show long term for that. And and when I'm sure is going to be back on the show, hopefully later this year for spooky season, because I wrote down some really cool notes about a fun episode that I think we could do. So make sure you guys stay tuned for that. But this has been amazing. And I'm so glad that we got to connect again. And yeah, I, I can't wait for next time. <laughs> Thank you so much for having me. It was so much fun chatting with you. So everyone, thank you for listening. Take care of yourselves. Be kind to each other. And I'll see you all next time. Bye, everyone.